I'm very pleased to be joined today by Dr. Frank Richter, Chairman of Horasis, the global business community. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for inviting me, a great pleasure, and I think it's the right time to talk about risk and uh, this gloomy state of the world. Correct. Uh, Frank, you just uh, recently concluded the Horasis Annual Meeting 2012 in Zurich, Switzerland, with a theme that I think is extremely interesting, namely thriving on risk. Um, I'd love to delve into some of the takeaways from the meeting, but before we do that, would you please tell us uh, how you started Horasis and uh, what the mission of the organization is? Well, Horasis is a global business community. We organize um, five large-scale events every year focusing on emerging markets. I used to um, look in the world from an uh, OECD angle, um, basically North America and Europe, and um, I think everybody uh, did in the past, but now uh, the growing uh, economies of the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India and China, are taking over. Not only taking over, but they um, uh, are the new engines of growth. What we would like to provide is um, some foresight on how the world is developing and also supporting those emerging countries drive for globalization to help to, uh, to establish uh, brands overseas and also to make the world a better world. We see so many imbalances in this world. We see a lot of um, unemployment now in Europe. We see inflation uh, in Asia. We see, of course, a lot of uh, geopolitical tensions. What we really need is dialogue. We have to um, bring the different um, stakeholders together to create a platform where people can not only talk, but think about um, tangible and sustainable solutions. So the idea of Horasis really is to be a platform for dialogue. We are um, stakeholders from emerging countries, from OECD countries, can meet and uh, look into um, joint projects to um, drive and to sculpture um, the future. I believe that um, uh, coming together and uh, building uh, a platform for, for trust, trust building is extremely important for business as well, because nobody will go into a business today without uh, having this um, uh, platform for trust where people can meet and talk. Wonderful, and, and I think this last event that you just uh, concluded in Zurich um, had an amazing um, list of participants, global business leaders as well as political leaders, and uh, what struck me was just how focused the event was on practical solutions, uh, specifically the theme of thriving on risk. Um, what was, was there a consensus, and if so, what was it, and if not, what were, what were the various views that were expressed at the meeting? It is a Horasis annual meeting with around 120 CEOs joining us from around um, 42 countries. We also got um, a few public figures involved, including the Prime Minister of Latvia, the Malaysian uh, Minister of Trade and the Minister President of Flanders. They came from all different corners, um, from all around the world, but uh, we, um, at the end of the day, we found a consensus saying that we have to join hands and to jointly think about uh, solutions. And we should stop to point fingers. It's very fashionable now to point fingers um, uh, to European leaders and saying what's happening in Europe is not good. Europe is kind of driving the world down into uh, a very bad malaise. And um, what we have to do is to regain a view on a, a balanced state of the world where both emerging countries and established countries can work together. The theme indeed was thriving on risk and uh, we looked into the different risk factors in this world today and there are many risks out there. Of course uh, the euro is a major risk, the currency in Europe, inflation I mentioned before, unemployment, social unrest um, and um, uh, what we have to do now is to have a positive attitude to thrive on risk, to understand the different risk factors and to find solutions where um, companies and societies at large can thrive and rebuild the future. So if you're a business leader today um, looking to position a global corporation to not only survive this uh, period of crisis but in fact benefit from it, what, what are some of the things you would um, think about or, or look into doing? I think uh, one important paradigm is the paradigm of um, outsourcing and offshoring. Today, 
they live in a virtual world. You can outsource and offshore almost everything, even your your headquarter. But definitely your R&D, um, your manufacturing. Take Apple for example. Apple is very much a virtual organization. Organization. They're not owning manufacturing anymore. It's all done in China or in other markets, creating employment actually in those markets, which is also good for society. And um, at the end of the day, I think we have to find solutions where um, things can be done best um, at the best price in the best time somewhere in the world. And um, I think Europe um, is still very good in certain things when it comes to high tech, when it comes to research, when it comes to high end uh, brands like um, in the automotive industry, take a BMW or Porsche. I think these things will always be here in Europe, but um, I think Europe will lose um, mass manufacturing. It's something of the past, and maybe in Europe we have to um, consciously abandon certain sectors in manufacturing and give it to Asia, give it to the emerging countries, and to find a new repartition of work uh, around the world. I think that's uh, just some, some ideas, and I very much believe in virtual organizations, again, outsourcing, Globalization is key. Maybe in the future, companies might only have um, 5, 10, 100 employees uh, in a small headquarter, maybe a virtual headquarter, somebody sitting in London, somebody else in Beijing and Tokyo, and all the rest is done by other people around the world. What we really need uh, to put all this together is leadership, a strong sense for leadership, somebody with charisma leading an organization, leading a company, and being able actually to create some common values um, in this organization to get everything into one direction and to have a great value added uh, to the customers. I think in the report summarizing the findings from your annual meeting, uh, you mentioned that the last decade was widely viewed as the decade of globalization, very favorably so. Now in this decade, um, globalization has become somewhat of a, of a contested word. Um, what do you think um, business leaders can do to ensure that uh, protectionism doesn't take over because of the challenges that a lot of countries face? Globalization indeed was uh, the buzzword of um, the last decade and uh, we face now a phase of deglobalization where people even go on the street. Think about the um, Occupy Wall Street uh, movement and um, uh, people there, I think they're right, you know, if you think about all the power centered in Wall Street and um, all the other people around who can't really share this power, people think about um, the benefits of globalization, if benefits really are out there and if um, benefits, um, benefits of globalization can spur the world into the right uh, direction. I believe that uh, globalization is here to stay. I think we can't um, uh, put it back. Uh, we can't um, go back to the nation state. We can't go back uh, to a world where um, you know countries fight against each other. Companies are always in string and competition. What we need is a world of cooptation, where competition and cooperation uh, coexist. And um, I feel that um, globalization uh, doesn't have to mean that everybody is eating the same kind of food or drinks the same kind of drinks. Still, we have uh, our local food, and I think we should be proud of our of our local food, of our local taste, of our local ambitions. Um, but still, in a globalized world, we uh, can we can try to give uh, the benefits to all the actors involved, and it's um, not a zero sum game. I believe it's um, a positive sum game where everybody can win. Many of our viewers um, are shareholders of global corporations um, that that operate in some jurisdictions that have had some issues, uh, such as China or Russia. What is your view on how those countries that need to catch up can best do so, and are you optimistic that they indeed will uh, join the global community in all aspects, including uh, legal and shareholder rights? See, we uh, host every year um, um, the four big country meetings. Um, exactly on the smart ads you mentioned, on China, on Russia, India, and the Middle East. And when you look from a New York or London perspective, of course you will see that they're not using the so-called Anglo-Saxon model, um, very much based on uh, transparency, shareholder rights, good corporate governance. Um, so I think um, uh, uh, the so-called Asian model um, is, uh, or maybe the model of state capitalism, is even competing with the Anglo-Saxon model. 
Um, but I see that many Chinese companies, let's talk about China for a second, are trying to adopt uh, a more Western model uh, as they are now going for IPOs listings outside China. It's quite fashionable to list in London, New York or Frankfurt or even Zurich. And here, of course, have to comply with uh, best global standards. I think um, the pendulum is kind of swinging back and forth. You know, sometimes we feel a bit more the Anglo-Saxon, sometimes more the Chinese model. And maybe the truth is in between. Uh, the, the true strength of the Chinese model actually is a very long-term perspective. In the Anglo-Saxon model, you have a very short-term orientation. You have to boost your share price. And just if I would say it's black and white, it's sometimes better to fire people to, to boost your share price. At least in the past, it was always perceived to be good news. But uh, maybe it's bad news for the people uh, involved and for the uh, productivity of your, your company. In the Chinese ways, uh, managers and owners very much look into uh, long-term development and even in um, a kind of co-development with society. I've been to um, Shanghai recently and I went to an interesting place called the Museum on the Future. It's uh, basically a museum where you can see how Shanghai and China will look like in around 40, 50 years from now. I believe, you know, this kind of view is not really existing in the Western world where we always go for quarterly reporting and uh, the boosting of our share price. So again, I think the truth might be in between and I would wish that we in the Anglo-Saxon world would also adopt some elements of the Chinese or Asian model. Mm -hmm. And um, talking about imbalances that exist not only um, among countries but also within countries and among folks of different um, economic um, fortunes, were there any um, ideas for how to deal with those imbalances and bring them perhaps in line with historical norms? Um, what, what came out of the meeting on, on that topic? And there was a very interesting uh, discussion with the Prime Minister of Latvia. And you know that Latvia uh, was one of the first countries going into a very deep structural crisis in uh, 2008 when the crisis um, came over from uh, the Atlantic and hit Europe. Uh, Latvia was hit first and uh, um, I think in 2008-2009 uh, the GDP um, shrank by around uh, 15%. Uh, what uh, the Prime Minister, a very young Prime Minister, uh, um, in his mid-30s did in, uh, in the beginning actually was to cut expenditure and uh, fiscal austerity. Austerity was really uh, the talk of the day. Today actually everybody uh, wants to copy Latvia and uh, it's not actually able to do so. You know, Greece has a lot of um, issues, people go on the street, but Latvia really was driving it through and was able to refix um, the, the economy. Uh, imbalances, yes, Latvia had um, uh, very, you know, important and um, uh, striking uh, imbalances, but now I think, you know, the crisis is over in Latvia and uh, Latvia is slowly growing again. And maybe it's a better Latvia now with a stronger middle class. Before, we had um, a few of those uh, so-called oligarchs you find in uh, most um, Eastern European countries, very wealthy entrepreneurs and almost no middle class. Uh, and uh, the big chunk of society actually was poor, living on um, maybe uh, three, four hundred euro per month. Now we see um, uh, a rising middle class and uh, Latvia was able to boost um, uh, middle class and to shrink the, the imbalances. I wish you know, other countries would copy this model but you need really a, a social contract where everybody is behind this model, behind this proposal, and you need a very good um, leadership from the top. I'm sure there was also discussion of some of the problem economies within the EU and, and what, how those uh, debt <coughs> issues and other issues might get resolved. Uh, was there a consensus on what is likely to happen in Europe or, and also on what should happen? It's a very interesting question, actually. You know, we had um, people from 42 countries, as I mentioned before, and uh, I think you can't really reach a consensus when it comes to Greece, for example, you know, the country really in the, uh, the center of the discussion. Most of our uh, American friends actually was uh, that just said, let them go. There's no way uh, to throw money after Greece. You know, uh, the country is, is basically bankrupt, and uh, you should stop and go for a fresh start. Maybe. View increase as a new emerging country where